Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we're going to give it just a minute as, as uh, people and uh, as folks trickle in uh, to get started, just so uh, we're not missing out on anyone as they come in. So we're going to give it about uh, a little bit less than a minute, maybe a minute, uh, and then we're going to get started. Thank you so much for being here. Great. Well, it looks like we've got a full house here and we're really excited to get started. So I'm going to kick this off. Welcome to the Earth Water Fire Seminar Series. Today's discussion is about restoring good fire to Western forests. My name is Katie Pofall and I'll be moderating this seminar with Quint Doan and James Perini. I'm a native of California and I've lived through California's most dramatic wildfire seasons. Now I'm a Master of Environmental Management candidate at the Yale School of the Environment, and I am developing my career as a land conservation practitioner who will put good fire on the ground. The discussion today will be 50 minutes, followed by a 10 minute question and answer session. Throughout the discussion, we encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We won't be answering questions throughout the discussion, but we have some time to address questions at the end. This seminar series was organized by the 2020 WE Scholars from Lewis and Clark Law School, Northern Arizona University, Yale School of the Environment, and Yale Law School with support from the WE Foundation. Now I'll pass things over to Quint Doan, who will introduce our series. Hi everyone, I'm Quint Doan. I am a dual degree student pursuing a JD and a Master of Environmental Science at Yale. Um, I work broadly with biodiversity conservation, community ecology, and how all those interact with the Endangered Species Act. Um, this series, it includes four seminars, each focused on different topic, water, fire, land, and collaborative conservation. These issues are uniquely important in the Western US and shifts in policy can have sweeping consequences for the well-being of people and nature in this region. These seminars will highlight important concepts that will support good policy making in light of the 2020 election. You can learn more about other discussions in this series at our website, which we'll link in the chat box. As for today's seminar, it's on good fire, reinstating a natural process and dry ecosystems. This panel will highlight the essential components of landscape scale restoration in fire dependent areas with leaders in fire ecology, project financing, policy making, and community engagement. We call this panel Good Fire because not all fire is good or natural. Hopefully this distinction will become more clear in our discussion today. We're thankful for the Wies Foundation for making this series possible and for the experts that will be speaking today. Um, we're also thankful for Yale University, in particular the faculty advisors that held up, helped us put this together, Lisa Bassani and Ray McKinnon. Uh, and finally, Caitlin Powers from the Wies Foundation was essential to making this all work. And I'm gonna turn it over to James. Thanks, Quint. Uh, we're now gonna take this opportunity to introduce our panelists. US Senator Ron Wyden, Elizabeth Azuz, Lania Quinn Davidson, and Marco Bay. We're gonna start with Senator Wyden because he won't be able to stay with us for the entire event. Senator Wyden will offer a few minutes of remarks. Uh, we'll then ask our panelists to introduce themselves in about a minute since, we'll, uh, since they'll be with us for the duration and we thankfully have the opportunity to get to know them a bit more once the Senator signs off. Uh, as a constituent, I prepared a quick statement of introduction for the Senator. So my name is James Pierini and I'm a forestry student at the Yale School of the Environment. More important to me at least, I'm an Oregonian. In summer 2020, my home state experienced the most destructive fire season in modern recorded history. Over 1.2 million acres and 4,000 properties were destroyed. The fires cost an estimated $609 million. Many have watched their livelihoods burn. Indigenous communities lost sacred spaces. At least 11 people lost their lives. Despite everything, Oregonians mobilized. We put our boots on the ground to fight the fires. We fundraise. We welcome neighbors into our homes offering shelter and, and comfort. We started conversations about environmental justice and the disproportionate impact of fires on historically disenfranchised communities. 
My state showed up. We also saw Senator Wyden and other lawmakers travel across our state to evacuation centers in the fire line. You met with community members, whether they voted for you or not. You convened diverse groups and listened. You offered your sympathy and leadership. Then you did something very few lawmakers do. You actually meant to work for us. You delivered a speech on the floor of the U.S. Senate. You co-sponsored bills supporting forest worker rights. You introduced sweeping legislation to mitigate catastrophic fires while putting Americans to work in the woods. You made the natural resources community proud. We know that our democracy is in crisis right now, but fire prone communities still need you. So thank you for taking time today and for your leadership. And with that, my home state Senator, Ron Wyden. James, thank you. Unquestionably an inflationary introduction and um, very gracious. You all <laughs> remember James from when he worked for the delegation. We've lost him to the Yale School of uh, Forestry, but we're going to hear a lot from James in the years ahead. And uh, good, to, good to be with you. I also want to thank the Weiss uh, Foundation for organizing the roundtable. And also, I think Molly McCusick is um, with us. Um, one of the stalwarts of the conservation community from when we worked uh, with uh, Bruce Babbitt all through the years. So obviously these incredibly punishing and serious fires are a wake up call for Westerners so that people see that forests are gonna burn. They've been burning for millennia, but land managers have been lucky basically over the last hundred years that you could suppress them. But with changing climate, you're not going to be able to suppress every fire, just not going to happen. So the question is not if an acre is going to burn, but what do you do when it does? And how do you prevent it? And how do you put together a sensible strategy? Now, the wildland firefighters I'm talking to have made it clear that they'd rather have a acre burn in cooler, wetter months when you have firefighters at the ready, rather than trying to play catch up ball when you have a fire that ignites on the hottest, driest, windiest day of the year and it happens in the backyards of our rural neighbors. So that's why Senator Manchin, Senator Cantwell and I introduced the uh, National Prescribed Fire Act. And uh, we think it's based on smart, effective science, reduces hazardous fuel load, and ultimately reduces risks to people, businesses, and homes. Uh, also, controlled burns are cheaper than mechanical treatments, and they're essential at restoring the long-term health and resiliency of the forest, and it's about one-fifth the cost of putting out a wildfire. In 2018, the Forest Service determined that 234 million acres of forests are at high risk of these fires. Yet the federal agencies are treating something like 3 million acres annually, which means that you're never gonna get out in front of the problem, not without resources. So the National Prescribed Fire Act takes a different approach to forest management and ensures that there's new tools and incentives to do large scale proactive hazardous fuels reduction. New funds uh, for controlled burns at the Forest Service and uh, at the Interior and collaborative controlled burn programs with um, some workforce um, efforts to increase the number of um, fire practitioners. Finally, the bill works within the Clean Air Act to give states more flexibility for extending their burn days so that they can increase the number of large scale controlled burns at the crucial time in the winter. And I'll close by saying this is only one part of the puzzle for me. Uh, I'm proposing efforts um, with colleagues um, to create a 21st century civilian conservation corps. Uh, the legislation would increase funding for hazardous fuels projects, thinning, home hardening and rangeland conservation designed to reduce wildfire risks 
and it would empower youth and conservation corps, um, as well as trail stewardship and nonprofits to expand this workforce that's so important, get people back to work in the woods. We don't want to see our homes burned down. We don't want to see our treasures destroyed. You pass these bills tomorrow, I think you start making forests more resilient, neighborhoods safer, businesses and people in a position to get back to work in the woods and in the mills. So uh, I'm going to be telling the Biden administration, they're talking about build back better. I'm saying that um, the severity of the wildfires means that we need to make a historic investment in our forest health. And if Congress acts now, we can make a big difference in forest health and rural economies. So let's go to, um, to questions and cover anything that, uh, James, you'd like to cover. Sure. So um, uh, thank you so much, Senator. Um, before we get started into questions, we're going to do a uh, quick introduction uh, for the rest of the group. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to keep the introductions to about a minute um, because Senator Wyden has to take off and we want to get to some questions and because we're going to have a lot of time to get to know the rest of the panelists a little bit more. Um, so, uh, Lania, if you if you wanted to get us started, do you mind uh, with a quick introduction about yourself and your work? Yeah, no problem, James. Um, thank you so much for having me. And it's a real honor to be on this panel with Marco and Elizabeth and Senator Wyden. My name is Lania Quinn Davidson, and I am a fire advisor with the University of California Cooperative Extension. I'm based on the north coast of California in Humboldt County, but I work um, regionally, statewide, and even nationally on various topics related to fire. And um, my passion is really around prescribed fire. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here and to, to hear more from Senator Wyden and to talk about you know, the role of prescribed fire in, in restoring and managing our, our landscapes here in the West. Um, I'm also the director of the Northern California Prescribed Fire Council, and I work really closely with folks from the Nature Conservancy and um, other nonprofit groups on, on things like prescribed fire training exchanges and um, prescribed burn associations, and really just trying to increase capacity for prescribed fire uh, at the local level. So, honor to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lania. Uh, Elizabeth, would you uh, want to go next? Absolutely. I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Azus. I am the secretary for the Cultural Fire Management Council in uh, Northern California on the Yurok Reservation. Our work here uh, is really set in our need for restoration of our natural resources, our basket materials, our food securities, our traditional medicines. And so seven years ago when we formed this nonprofit, we had absolutely no idea that we were gonna be this far along. Um, it's been amazing to work with all of the organizations, the Nature Conservancy, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Forest Service, Lania um, is an amazing resource for us. She's a wonderful uh, advocate for what we do. So I am honored to be here and to learn from you all. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I, I, I am certain that the, the feeling is likewise uh, here with the panelists and, and uh, uh, with the, uh, those who've joined us today as well. Um, so last, Marco, uh, would you mind uh, giving us a quick bio? Sure. Good afternoon. Thank you, James. Um, thank you for the opportunity and uh, nice to see you again, Senator Wyden. And you as thank well. you for all your support of increasing the pace and scale of uh, forest restoration over the many years. My name is Marco Bay. I'm executive director of Loma Katsi Restoration Project. We're based in Ashland, Oregon, uh, southwestern Oregon. And uh, we work to restore ecosystems and the sustainability of communities, cultures, and economies, uh, really trying to set the stage for the return of good fire on the ground. Actually, our crews are out on the ground burning today. Uh, we've completed about 700 acres the last several days. And hopefully we can get some uh, good underburning accomplished uh, in the spring and hopefully in the fall coming. So um, really excited about this opportunity to share and really excited about the National Prescribed Fire Act and the opportunities that might bring. I also serve as the board president of the Southern Oregon Forest Restoration Collaborative, where we're developing a very strong cohesive strategy to uh, address uh, 
the restoration of our dry forest systems and especially excited about the uh, youth uh, capacity you discussed, Senator Wyden, and uh, how to increase that uh, capacity on the ground and create more jobs. It's really near and dear to our heart as an organization. So we partner with tribes, federal uh, and state agencies, other nonprofit organizations, uh, and excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marco. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to acknowledge before we get going, uh, Elizabeth Lania and, and Marco represent um, just uh, I I incredible people at the forefront of, of putting fire on the ground and doing so in culturally responsive and, and meaningful ways. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we didn't get, get to uh, spend time giving the, the full deference to their work like we did with Senator Wyden, but we want to sort of appreciate and admire and, and uh, uh, um, as graduate students from the Weiss Foundation organizing this event, just to appreciate their work uh, as we get into our Q&A. So, uh, on that, I'm going to turn it over to Quint, who's going to get us started. Great. Thanks, James. So our first question is for Senator Wyden, and it's uh, you've shared some information about the measures you've introduced. How do you envision this money being put to use? Um, in particular, how would you prioritize among the needs of the various vested interests? Um, we'll get to that. I do want to make clear that we're so lucky to have one of the house's rising stars sponsor this effort in the house. Um, Congressman Nagus of Colorado has been really putting in a lot of effort into this. And I just having to, having had the opportunity to get to know him, he's gonna be one of the house's rising stars. So if there are any Coloradans on the call, um, y'all are lucky. He's really a good guy and you really enjoy. Um, working with them. Um, there's a massive need on the ground to do more hazardous fuels reduction. Uh, the federal land managers are trying to learn from tribal govern governments. They've been doing controlled burns uh, for years. And by establishing a controlled burn fund at the Forest Service and at Interior, we put funding towards actually implementing controlled burns. The other part of the bill is the workforce um, development because we got to hire more women in fire, create expanded opportunities for women in fire jobs. That's a big, uh, big priority. Now, both of the bills that I'm focused on, the 21st Century Conservation Act, the Prescribed Fire Act, have new uh, tribal forestry programs and workforce programs are specific. And this acknowledges the incredible importance of tribal sovereignty and for ensuring tribes have meaningful opportunities on how public lands are managed. And the fact is there's a lot of knowledge and expertise out there for science-based forestry. And I think these two bills give us a chance to work in a smart and different uh, way on hazardous fuels reduction and creating jobs and making forests um, healthier. And that's uh, what I'm spending my time on. Great, thank you. And we actually wanted to go to Marco as a practitioner and we wanted to understand more about why is it so difficult and expensive to get this fire on the ground? Well, I, um, as Senator White had mentioned earlier, you know, that obviously prescribed fire and potentially even managed fire treatments can be uh, way more cost effective than mechanical treatments. But parts of our landscape are um, really steep, really inaccessible and really dense. And um, there's layered challenges with uh, threatened endangered species working in late successional reserves. So there, there's places where there's better opportunity, but we've departed 100 to 150 years since fire has seen a lot of these places. And um, Mechanical treatments are going to have to be one of the steps for a lot of these areas before we set the stage and obviously not everywhere. Um, so you're looking at anywhere from a thousand to $2,500 an acre to reduce these very dense stand conditions that haven't seen fire. And those are expensive treatments from from that mechanical work. And then we're going to have to utilize an ecological forestry approach to commercial um, byproduct restoration. So uh, in order to um, 
get our forest in a resilient state, protect our uh, large legacy tree features on the ground. And um, we're gonna have to implement a lot of that expensive helicopter work in some locations, places we really care about and other areas it's gonna be a lot, way more cost effective. So that mechanical work is, is spendy and then prescribed fire can be um, expensive for initial treatments as we've, as we've seen in a lot of our projects. Uh, and then if we're thinking about layering in um, good paying jobs and uh, treating workers well and paying workers a good wage, um, that's another component as we change the culture of um, really forest workers being kind of second class citizens in the woods. We wanna elevate firefighters and forest workers to um, a livelihood that uh, you know, is full time and that they can uh, enjoy the benefits of uh, good, good paying jobs. So that's just a, an initial, there's probably a lot more to it, but. Great, thank you, Marco. And um, Lania, we know that you've been working also on similar policy options within state government. Uh, can you share some of those experiences with us? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I think there's a, a lot of interest right now in California in making some policy changes to enable more prescribed fire. And I think one of the things that's exciting to me about it is that it doesn't all have to be about funding. We certainly need a lot more funding for this work, but there are some kind of more, I like to call them structural barriers to prescribed fire in California and across the country. Um, that we can address with legislation that I think could really unleash a lot of the interest and momentum that we have for prescribed fire. So in California right now, we're about to roll out a state certified burn boss program that was mandated by some legislation in 2018. And um, it's kind of been going through final approvals at the state level, but it will roll out this year. And I think we, we've got a number of legislators in California right now who are trying to figure out ways to provide some, some extra benefit um, through that certification program. So if we're going to certify people as burn bosses in California, we want to confer some benefit to them that incentivizes the program and, and ensures that the program is successful so we can really increase the use of prescribed fire. So we're looking at negligence laws right now in California. We're looking at insurance for prescribed fire. Um, you know, there most prescribed fire practitioners working on private ground in California have very little access to insurance, and they're still subject, you know, to the same liability laws as someone who has no training in prescribed fire. So, these are some structural issues that I think we could really effectively address with with um, policy work, and that's been my focus in the last couple months. Great, thank you, Lania. And um, for Elizabeth, as a practitioner and advocate for a fire on Native American lands, how can funding be useful and meaningful to your work? Um, that's a good question. And I believe Marco and Lania have already answered most of that. You know, for us as a Native nonprofit, like I said, we started this originally to restore our natural resources. Our basket weavers didn't have materials they needed. And so they came to us as a group and asked us to start doing that. Little did we know we were going to branch out into many different directions, uh, the food securities, the me medicines, the land restoration piece was huge. Um, we partnered with our tribe basically to um, work on our carbon credits uh, programs, to work on our waterways. Um, there's so many different things that have been added to us as a group that um, we had to grow. We literally started, uh, we have this time for the first time, a full-time crew that we were able to hire because we received a nearly $1 million grant with CAL FIRE. The money is huge for us as a small organization. You know, we've bought vehicles this year, we've bought equipment, we're buying all the things we need to have a fully functioning prescribed fire crew. Um, as Lania talked about the prescribed burn boss training, we're going to be having some of our participants train so that we can eventually hire ourselves out to the community to train other um, prescribed fire burners to restore the land. So funding is a huge issue for us and it's difficult. We mostly live off of grants, to be honest. 
Um, but with the prescribed fire training, we'll be able to make um, our own funding source so that we'll be able to continue to grow this organization to help our communities in our state better. Great. Thank you all so much for your answers. I'm going to give it over to Katie for our next set of questions. Yeah, thank you so much for highlighting the ways that policy has real impact on the ground. And just to note that Senator Wyden had to go. Um, I believe he's got some important work to do with the federal government. So um, I just wanted to thank him and his staff for joining um, and just make everybody aware that uh, if he's, you've got follow up questions for him, we can sure send those along. Um, but I wanted to jump in. So, you know, we, we had the chance with Senator Wyden to focus in a bit more on policy and enacting. Um, you know, how, how these policies will be enacted on the ground. Um, and, but we wanted to broaden out a little bit more. And this is a question for Lenya. Um, and we do have a question from the audience highlighting this issue as well. Um, there's been a lot of news about the destructive power of fire and oftentimes we call that bad fire. Um, and I think we're you know, here highlighting the importance um, in, in, in essence, the critical role of good fire. Can you help us understand the distinction between those two? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I, I will say I kind of struggle with that dichotomy um, of good fire versus bad fire because it's so nuanced and so subjective and it really depends on, you know, on the communities and the, um, the habitat types and the way that fire burns. It's, it's all, it's really subjective and value based. And so I think when, when we think about good fire, um, we're not just talking about you know, reducing fuels or fire that burned at low severity. We're really talking about fire that is promoting the values that we care about. And, um, and that could look different depending on who you are and, and what your, you know, what your values are. So uh, when we, in the prescribed fire context, we use fire in a lot of different ways. And, um, and the good part of it really comes from, you know, what people, the way that people are connecting with fire. So for Elizabeth, good fire might look a lot different than, than for a rancher who's trying to manage invasive species. And so we, it's just really context-based, but I think that the thing to know is that so many of our habitats and our communities are fire adapted and even fire dependent. And so fire is good because it, it's able to promote and, and help those um, communities persist, whether those are human or natural communities. And, and yeah, we, we can use fire in so many different ways. And that could be prescribed fire or it could be wildfire. And, you know, I think it's frustrating when you see media coverage of wildfire because it's always portrayed in this really negative way, but wildfire is doing a lot of great work on the ground too. And so we have to have that nuanced perspective and really be able to weigh what our values are and how fire gets us there. Thanks, Lena, and thank you for that focus on, um, you know, the really the cultural and intentional aspects of fire. And I think, um, so our next question we wanted to direct to Elizabeth, um, and I think Marco touched on this a bit, but how did we get to this point where we've got such a problem with, um, you know, destructive fire in our communities and forests? And, and I'd love to hear a little bit more background on your perspective on that. Yeah. Um... I'd like to start that out by saying that I started burning at four years old, not because it was a family training, but simply because I was a child that wanted to see what fire was about. And my grandfather, who was blind, made me sit down and informed me of what fire really meant to us as human beings, um, how it was meant to care for our environment, how it was meant to keep us warm, how it was meant to cook our food. And so I've always had um, great reverence for fire. Um, for me, you know, we're at this point now because basically uh, people or organizations believe that people on the land did not know how to care for the land, that they were incapable of putting fire on the land in a safe manner. It couldn't be further from the truth. This land was managed from since time immemorial, basically, by the indigenous peoples that lived on it. And when you take that piece out of there, when you take that component away from everyone and tell them that they cannot manage their environment any longer, we end up with a tinderbox, basically. So, you know, for me, um, 
wildfire. You know, it's frightening for most people. For me, it's, it's something that's doing its job. Fire is a tool for us. My grandfather used to tell me it's not a toy, it's a tool. It does its job. It cleans our environment. It takes care of, you know, the invasive species. It helps us to restore our waterways. So, you know, we got to this point basically because we set it aside and we said, you know what, you're not capable of doing this. So let's find another way to do this. We already know what the way is to do it. We know that we need to restore the land, that we need to keep working with it. And it's like any other piece of our life. If you don't maintain it, it will become out of control. Thank you, Elizabeth. That really highlights, I think, that component of ecological health that drives home the human connection. Um, and we also wanted to talk a little bit more about the need for a localized response. Um, I think Lania's answer really mm -hmm. helped us see that there's nuance and as well as, you know, I would imagine traditional burning is different than ranching. Um, and mm -hmm. so, yes. you know, fire ecologists talk about this need for a localized response. Um, can you help us understand how this mm -hmm. applies you know, both in your context, um, in your off lands, and also, um, you know, if we could hear from Lania to speak a bit more about how that applies in a policymaking context too. Yeah, um, I'd like Lania to go first, actually, if you don't mind. Um, no problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the local aspect is so important for decision making around fire and for capacity building. And um, we saw this year in California with response that we pretty quickly overwhelmed the resources that we had. And in some places, those local resources became critical for protecting resources and, and making decisions. So um, in the wildfire context, we know that local capacity is huge and that we need to be supporting that and lifting it up in whatever ways we can, whether that's through funding or workforce development and training, um, the kinds of things that, you know, that Marco and Elizabeth both work on. Those are essential for moving forward with, with the future we have with fire. And then from the, the fuels perspective and the habitat creation perspective and prescribed fire, um, again, I think that local context and those local values are so critical. And for so long, we've approached these issues from a really top-down perspective where our agency, you know, our federal and state agencies are the ones making decisions and leading projects and making approvals and kind of leaving the community out of that and leaving, you know, the, the, the tribes out of it and the, the, the other local practitioners. And we're really seeing that it's time to mm -hmm. give agency and authority to the folks who live on these landscapes, who care about those resources, and, um, and who are the true stewards of the land. So uh, the work that I do, I, I'm always trying to lift up the community, the, you know, the community level, the community perspective, and the community values, because I think that's where the longevity is. That's where the, um, you know, that's where the heart is. And I think that the more we can bring the heart mm -hmm. to our fire work, the, the more success we'll have and a better future we'll have. Yeah. Um, to add to that, you know, for us uh, here on the Yurok Reservation, we have Cultural Fire Management Council has partnered with the Yurok Tribe. So yes, we are Yurok Tribal members. However, we are a nonprofit separate from our tribe. And it's always interesting dealing with government and non-government agencies. Um, even though our tribal organization wants the same thing we want, they also have their own rules, their own policies, their own air quality. And so for me, as a permitting person, I am permitting uh, our burns through our tribe, I'm permitting our burns through the county, I'm permitting through the state. Um, everybody wants their little piece of information to make sure that what we are doing is accurate, um, safe, and that we're looking at all of the options. Uh, for me, um, having to learn to do all of this has been really interesting because I actually have a medical background. I'm a retired nurse. And so coming back home to the reservation, I made the mistake of going to a tribal council meeting and saying, I've been gone 30 years, I'm back. Why are we in the same place? And an elder said to me, well, what are you gonna do about it? And me and my big mouth, seven years later, I'm still here um, trying to convince people that this is the right thing to do. 
that we need to restore our land, that we need to restore our environment, that we need to work together. We all need to be on the same page in order to make sure that this planet that we all depend on is going to be here for us. So working with those agencies, this is your huge piece. You know, meet with them, talk with them. We don't all have to agree. We don't all have to like each other, but we all need to get to the same point in order to survive where we're at. So work together, everybody, please, let's make this work. It, it's possible. I've seen it happen. I've seen the Yurok, Karuk, and Hupa tribes work on the same programs together when there are some things we can't even agree on on a daily basis, but we all know how important it is to restore the land. That is indeed a, a very wonderful example of collaboration. And thank you for sharing that and highlighting um, the role of sovereign governments. Um, so I'd like to now pass to James. He's got a couple of broad thinking questions for the group. Thank you. And, and uh, uh, super interesting so far. I'm, I'm really grateful for this. Um, uh, I, I think that um, uh, uh, definitely Lania and, and Elizabeth uh, kind of touched on this. So I'm going to ask this question uh, to Marco, if you don't mind. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm curious, uh, uh, Marco, you and I have, I've gotten to know your work just a little bit uh, in the past um, in, in my sort of uh, career. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, knowing that capacity is, is sort of an issue is, um, how do you get your work to scale uh, through Loma Kasi while keeping in mind that need for local response and uh, different sort of cultural proclivities and, 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 and the sort of diversity of, of people and stakeholders that might be involved in that? Yeah, to pick up on um, this great conversation <clears throat> what Lenny and Elizabeth were building on around, you know, the need to work together and, and collaboration. I think that's a, a, a big part of it is um, layering those different skill sets and those different um, relationships to, to get these projects up to scale. And one thing that struck me, and I'll, I'll get to the core of the question with the Cultural Fire Management Council, one thing I'm really inspired by is, um, you know, because we have a tribal partnerships program within our organization led by tribal members. And really it relates to uh, community-based organizations having the innovation and flexibility to um, maneuver to um, get this good work done on the ground and culture fire fire management council's done that the northern fire prescribed fire council we're really an anchor as non-government organizations loma Katsi, to um, assist our agency partners and the static that can happen in in bureaucracy but we also want to lean upon uh, you know obviously policy appropriations and our, our agency partners to to help bring things to scale so um, the model that we utilize, even though we're, we're based in Southwest Oregon, I'm calling from Modoc County today in the lands of the Gaduka did Northern Paiute. I'm looking out my window at Sage Step Country. And um, you know, it, it, this model can be replicated and um, based on the community's needs, based on the landscape. But what we need is, is the, the agreements, the long-term large scale agreements. So we're not creating just make work programs. Mm -hmm. We're creating long-term projects that have uh, uh, underpinnings of good science, a real analysis with the end result of getting a uh, good fire on the ground, uh, restoring these dry forest systems, but uh, leveraging those local opportunities. So not coming into a community and uh, coming in and what does the community need and uh, initiatives led by the tribes, led by the community, and then uh, building it from the bottom up, I think is very, very important um, and Lenya touched on this, that top-down approach uh, can be detrimental to our work sometimes. So how we, how we utilize our model is um, building that workforce capacity around large-scale projects. So master stewardship agreements are a big mechanism, 10 to 15-year agreements, uh, projects that the NEPA and, and the analysis is developed collaboratively from the ground up and they're, they, it engages the community. And then through that, there's a parallel track of workforce development, incubating local businesses, training, building local skill sets. So we're not developing a, a short-term initiative and people have to go to work elsewhere. The issue with a lot of these landscapes is the seasonality of the work is short, especially east of the Cascades. You're looking at a five to six month uh, operational window and also diversifying skill sets, technical training, 
um, ability for even ground up folks to be able to contribute to burn plan writing inventory work. Um, so not just the, the drip torch on the ground, which is really important and a really important art, but also diversifying those skill sets. Um, so that's that's just you know one one snapshot into it. And then as we develop these pods of workforce and capacity across our region, we can help each other and we can mobilize and support each other, uh, even if it's three to four hours away, and bring that capacity, burn boss credentials, um, other contract capacity to get this to get this work done. And then a whole community approach of investing in youth, uh, higher education, and then you know strong boots on the ground. So um, I think uh, large long-term projects, right now we're, we're looking at 144,000 acres on one of our large initiatives over the next decade. And uh, that's gonna create some long-term work for people to really invest, invest in starting businesses, invest in um, building capacity. Thank you, Marco. I'm, I'm gonna get on to our, our last question here uh, before we get on to some Q and A. Um, and I think what Marco mentioned is a really nice segue. Um, what I was hearing Marco say was a lot about sort of um, this work at different scales uh, and, and this very sort of uh, apparent and obvious uh, fact that um, there's not a one size fits all approach um, to, to some of this work, especially as it lands on different communities uh, where they live uh, and how uh, they are interacting with fire in their landscape. Um, so this is a very broad question, and I promise I'm not trying to gaslight you here and would just like to get your thoughts on it. Um, but the question is, uh, does, exist <laughs> does, uh, does existing law support fire management strategies adequately uh, where you're working? And the follow up being, uh, what sort of trends in management are you seeing from different government agencies? And how do you hope some of those policies might change or evolve in the future? Uh, to better facilitate your work. Um, so very broadly, are the laws currently adequate? What trends are you noticing? Uh, and lastly, what could the future look like um, where policies are shifting to better enable the work that, that you hope to do? Um, Elizabeth, I see that you're unmuted. Do you wanna start? Or otherwise I can, I can call on someone else too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um. You know, for us, uh, like I said, building this organization was for us to be able to train our young people, to be able to carry on the work that Margo and I will not be able to do forever. Um, bringing them together was one of the greatest things we've done because we work with a lot of grad students. Those students are able to not only study their field while working with us, but they're also able to help us create uh, a program that will last for, you know, gosh, eternity, we hope, you know, but for us, you know, the policies that block us, um, the permitting, the paperwork, the organizations you have to go through, and it's not a one size fit all for everybody. Um, Lania's organization is going to have completely different needs than Marco's or ours, um, just depending on where you live, whether you're in tribal territory, whether you're in, you know, state, federal, wherever you're at there's gonna be a different set of policies and paperwork that's gonna be required for that. And so for me, I consider myself an infant in this field because I'm learning every day something new that is going to help our organization survive. Um, training all of these young people and having them out there and seeing the look in their face when they realize that they can make a difference in their own environment and that they can learn the policies and procedures that are necessary to further our cause. That's all I really need to make this work for me. I'll continue to work for as long as I possibly can to make sure all these groups and organizations can work together and that we can all come to the same consensus that we need to restore this environment. Thank you so much for that. Um... Um, uh, Lania, Marco, would you like to, Lania, would you, do you want to? Yeah, sure. I'll say something to that. Um, so I see your question was kind of three part and I guess I'll start with, um, you know, you asked if the laws are adequate, do we have what we need in place to, to do the, the work that we need to do? And I'll say, I definitely don't think it's all about the laws being inadequate. You know, I think we have a lot of other kind of social and political issues that are, are not 
about the laws. They're about attitudes. They're about lack of bold leadership, um, especially I think in you know on our federal landscapes and and with our state agencies and organizational alignment. You know, so we have people on the ground who are ready to do this work. They're excited. They're passionate about getting these projects done, and then they're getting messages sometimes from the top that um, that are not supportive or not enabling them to do the kind of work that they want to do on the ground. So, you know, I think this fall was a good example. I have a close colleague who works with the Forest Service and um, they have, and the Park Service in a dual role and have a lot of projects that were ready to go, prescribed fire projects for this fall and got a pretty heavy hand, there was a pretty heavy handed um, message that was sent out from the top level saying, you know, it's really risk averse. We need to not make any mistakes this year. It's been a bad year. It's been a big fire season. Every, you know, make sure that you don't do anything wrong. Not the supportive message of like, wow, we had a really big wildfire season. It's time to get this work done. Like this is even more important now than, than ever before. And so I think that organizational alignment and that, that bold leadership is missing in some cases. And, um, and it's really a cultural issue and an attitude issue that we we need to change. I hope, I think the more public support and the more social license there is for this work, um, you know, the more that'll kind of help shift some of our fire managers toward feeling more supported. But um, I think that the trends that we're seeing with the policy work are really exciting. I think like the, the bill that, that Wyden developed and the movement that we're seeing in California are definitely headed in the right direction. We're seeing some positive trends um, with the policy framework and, and kind of the legislative path that's being taken. And I think there are more and more areas that we could work on. I'd like to see air quality get tackled a little more closely in California um, so that there aren't disincentives for things like prescribed fire uh, in the ways that there are now. It's It really, you know, it is a challenging issue to work on. And so hopefully air quality will, will become part of the, um, the policy framework here pretty soon too. So anyway, I hope that helps. Oh, that was, that was absolutely, that was wonderful. Um, thank you so much for that insight. And uh, Marco, did you, do you have any thoughts? Uh, I can repeat the question. There was a lot there if, you, if you'd like. Oh, I think I got it and I've been uh, okay. listening to Elizabeth and Lennon. It's, it's I'm thinking about uh, the different, it is a cultural shift, but thinking about the, um, the landscape location. Um, I'm thinking about the Modoc National Forest out here that had the July complex this summer, and a lot of good uh, uh, fire was able to burn through a managed fire approach. So the tools are there. Uh, the policy can support um, more prescribed burning. It is up to oftentimes line officers and forest supervisors and the regional offices that make decisions on, um, and I guess I'm thinking more on the managed fire side, uh, obviously, in a wildland urban interface setting with a lot more um, homes at risk and denser populations, you're going to have a different set of um, uh, approaches from, from managers. Um, so I, there is something positive, though. There, there is a shift happening, and it, um, it's reminding me of when we took um, uh, Senator uh, Merkley up on a prescribed burn. We put a helmet on him. We had him light, uh, use a drip torch. So, you know, that bottom-up influence that makes it to these uh, uh, policies that get developed and give us the opportunity to increase the pace and scale of what, of what we're, we're trying to do. Um, I think we have a lot of good tools and we have to continue to work with uh, decision makers in the agencies to um, support our, 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 our work forward. So I don't know if that contributed, but um, thumbs up. No, that was fantastic. Um, Thank you so much, Marco. Thank you all. Um, we're going to transition really quickly uh, to some Q&A questions, and we got a bunch of good questions. Um, and so I'm just going to keep uh, keep us rolling if you don't if you don't mind. So um, there was one there was one question that sort of called into mind the very sort of name that we gave to this panel, which was uh, Good Fire. And so um, this is a question for all the panelists, and feel free to jump in here. I can sort of help uh, help with that too. But the question is. Um, Historic tribal burning is often referenced in literature as good fire. However, tribal voices are often left out of conversations about current fire practices and policy and management decisions. How can we build a more inclusive table? So 
So I think that that's uh, um, um, really for anyone, if anyone wants to jump in on that one. I'm curious, Marco, to hear more about uh, Lomakotsi's work on doing that. I know that Lomakotsi has been sort of actively engaged in, in sort of uh, outreach to uh, indigenous communities and, and tribal governments in, in Oregon and Northern California. Is there something that you might be able to, to address when it comes to that? Yeah, I can share Is a that little okay? bit and, you know, I, that's fine. And, and um, you know, I, you know, this, th this has been a, a a focus of our organization. It's not just uh, the, the seat at the table, it's actually changing the demographics and the culture of our organizations um, to include more tribal leadership in our board of directors for organizations that are multicultural, um, in our board of directors, in our executive leadership. And that's um, something we've been working on the last decade and really over the last five years. And then um, bringing those voices into uh, arenas that they're not heard or they're not there's not a seat at the table we've developed the inner tribal ecosystem restoration partnership uh, that's managed by our tribal partnerships director belinda brown and what that does is it, it brings a tribal voice and it brings multiple uh, uh, tribal voices to the table in, in forest service collaboratives so in the rogue river siskiyou different than the you know on, on yurok and paduk lands where people are in place in their landscape, uh, a lot of the tribes in those areas have been um, forcibly relocated. The keystone species of keeping fire on the ground removed. So trying to bring that voice back and welcome the people home to their homelands is a lot of the, the work we've been, we've been doing. Uh, the, the Grand Ronde, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, Confederated Tribes of Siletz, the Shasta Nation, um, the Uncle Ben of Cow Creek Indians, trying to uh, assist through our tribal partnerships program in uh, bringing those values to prescribed burn planning through NEPA decisions, incorporating an eco-cultural restoration perspective. Because um, in places where there's a strong tribal presence, it's the tribes are leading is what I see. I see that in, in Yurok, Karuk, in the, with the Klamath tribes in the Arpa Basin. Um, we see that in Pitt River country and with the Northern Paiute. So um, assisting in, in building those bridges, because oftentimes there's not even a thought of the cultural perspective. So um, that, that's a lot of the, the work we've been doing over the last five years and really since our inception. Yeah. So that inner tribal network is, is a safe place for that. Mm. Um, Elizabeth, did you, uh, did you care to comment on this question? Yeah, um, along the same lines of Marco, we have been, um, the Cultural Fire Management Council has worked with the Nature Conservancy and Mary Huffman to create the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network. The reason for that network was to help tribes um, have their burning rights reinstated, to have control of their lands. Um, uh, Bill Tripp and I have often talked about having the right to do our own permitting, having the right to say when it's okay for us to burn. Uh, cultural fire burns twice a year. And being able to be in control of our environment and our rights um, as human beings is something that's really, really important to all tribes. But working with the Indigenous Peoples uh, Burning Network has showed me that there are so many tribes across this United States that are just left out of the planning completely altogether. They have absolutely no right to um, their own environment. And it's really kind of uh, eye opening for me because being here in our reservation where we definitely um, assert our sovereignty and talk about our rights and what we need, um, having the Klamath River uh, given basically personhood so that you know everything in our environment has a voice and has a right and has a place. The people deserve that. The people need that. The people need to be able to say, this is where we have been since time immemorial. I live directly above my family's village, right at the confluence of the Klamath and Trinity River. My family history is an oral history, and I can only recount 500 years of it. 
but there are some tribes that can't recount a year of their history because they've been so decimated by you know the current populations and feel left out feel like they've never been given a voice so we actively try to put you know native people in places where policies are changed where they're shifted and to give us a voice to give the people that voice back so you know we're here we're not going away we're going to be trying really hard to make um this world a better place mm, thank you so much for that um so uh, um I, we're just going to have time for one more sort of set of comments and I guess I, I I would be curious to take that question and Lania I have I have uh, sort of a question uh, for you if you don't mind um, I'm just taking that sort of uh, um, theme and idea of um, individuals who are at the table as decision makers and and as sort of leaders in fire uh, knowing your work and and sort of uh, interested in the uh, expanded interests of diversity equity and inclusion uh, specifically with your work in W Trex. Um, how important is it uh, that the makeup of leaders and people who are putting fire on the ground be uh, sort of uh, re-envisioned uh, from the more Western standpoint and perspective uh, of what it currently looks like today uh, versus what it what it should or could like and look like in the future? Well, <laughs> that's a big a big question, obviously, and something I think about a lot in the work that I do with the um, with the W tracks, which is the women's um, prescribed fire training exchange event. And the way I like to think about it is, you know, we have like the fire the fire issues that we're dealing with right now are so wicked and so big and so complex. And why wouldn't we want um, the the greatest minds? together working on these issues? Why would we want to limit ourselves to one demographic um, to, to work on and, and solve these problems? And for so long, that's what fire, fire management has been. It's been pretty much one demographic working on this issue. And there's a certain amount of group think that happens there, um, bias that you know is sometimes intentional and a lot of times not intentional. And when you think about diversity in fire, it's not diversity for diversity's sake. It's really about innovation and, and bringing together great minds and, um, and maximizing our opportunity to, to do good work. So I really think we, we need to create space for different perspectives, for different types of leadership, for different backgrounds. And um, that's how you know, we'll have the, the best thoughts and ideas coming forward. And so that's what equity and inclusion is all about. Well, thank you for those final thoughts, Lania, um, whether you knew it or not. I think that's all we've got time for. Um, and I think that's just a really wonderful message to end on that, you know, policy when it touches the ground really needs to have full participation of the communities that are affected um, in order to get the best results. It's, you know, not just diversity for diversity's sake. We really feel powerfully about these, um, these efforts for inclusion that you've been such a strong part of. So. Um, we wanted to thank you and, of course, um, all of our esteemed panelists for joining us today um, and also our attendees for asking questions. Um, this is all the time we've got for our discussion um, today, but we'd like to thank all of you once more um, and also for your unwavering commitment to wise resource management in the Western United States. Um, our next seminar is Defending Our Public Lands next Wednesday, same time, January 20th please visit our website, conservationpolicydiscussions.org to learn more, register and see recordings of our previous seminar about water. Um, and we encourage you to share this series with your friends, colleagues and elected officials. So um, with that, I'll just close out a, a great thank you to um, the folks who remain and a happy new year to everyone. Thank you.